are what their problems are. <laughs> but we're to pray for them anyway, so praise the Lord. And there's many others that are sick and afflicted at this time, so <coughs> any re other requests here this morning as we would look to the Lord? My father. Your father as well, yes. Okay. My husband Your husband going for surgery? Yes. Unspoken. Unspoken. All right. Let's bow our head. Heavenly Father, as we come before thy throne of grace this morning, Lord, we thankful that we can approach thee. And Lord, that you've heard these prayer requests even before, Lord, they were even asked. And I thank you, Lord, that you're concerned about your thy children. Lord, we have come into this service to praise and to worship thee, Lord, and we ask that you would have your way. We ask all these things in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You see it at this time? Uh, they got new chairs, so try them out. If you fall asleep, I still have the tennis ball, so. <laughs> Praise the Lord. No, I wouldn't use that, so it's, it's not right. I'm going to ask Brother Paul to come lead us in the song service, so. It's good to see everyone out this morning. so much to thank him for each and every day. You can never thank him enough. There's a roof up above me in a good place to sleep. 
this morning? Twenty-eight in the red book. Unless Kathy knows it. <laughs> right now? Right here in the breast? I do? Okay. Do you want to start it maybe? No? Gary sang it? Yeah, Gary, you could come up and help me sing this song. Do you know this song, Haven of Rest? Do you want to come up and sing it?
try 116 in the blue book? Can I play it in G, Kathy? Sure. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain and you have peace of mind like you've never known. And then things change when you're down in the valley. God of the good time. 
Elijah, did you have a song this morning? If you could see why I once was If you could go with me All back to where I started from Then I know you would see A miracle of love that took me in and sweet embrace and made me what I am today just a sinner saved by grace oh I'm just a sinner oh saved by grace
Sister Monique, do you have a song this morning? Crystal, do you have a song afterwards?
tempest. He's an anchor that assures in times like these. Just ahead I could not see those dark clouds so heavy with rain. And when the winds blew hard against me, he called out and I ran to him. Now She has a song. I appreciate the Lord this morning. Last Sunday, I asked Sister Sarah to pray, to ask for prayers for my sister's son. He was in intensive care. He caught a bacteria and was down in his lungs. been in a coma since yesterday he woke up. And he's talking and his eyes are open. And I truly, truly believe that God 
God hears yes. his children's requests. Try low chorus, maybe if it'll help you. I will cast all my cares upon you. I will lay all my burdens. Sorry, I have a cold. Down at your feet. Many times when I don't.
Everybody happy? We'll just uh, turn the service around to Brother Fred. You could all stand, change your positions.
Shall I praise the Lord? Oh, it's pretty loud. Okay. Maybe I got it up too high or something. I don't know. They can adjust it back there. Praise the Lord. Everybody happy? And Let's just bow our head for a moment. Heavenly Father, as we come before thy throne of grace, Lord, we know there's nothing in ourselves, but Lord, except you come on the scene, Lord, and you anoint our eyes to see and our ears to hear, Lord. Lord, we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory, for it belongs to thee. Thy truth belongs to thee, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, what you've done for us in this hour. Now I commit it in this service part in your hands. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. been on that half hour of silence for a while and uh, there's other things I want to bring into the picture this morning. If you want to turn with me I believe we'll start in the book of Revelation chapter 1. The book of Revelation, actually, it's to the bride. And the book of Revelation is a prophetic book, not a doctrinal salvational book. But in it is a lot of instruction for the bride in this hour, where the bride has been, where she's at now, and what's coming up the road up ahead. And when Jesus said, Watch and pray. Most of the time when he was talking about watching and praying, he says, watching concerning his coming, because you know not when he's going to come. Because he said he would come as a thief in the night. Now there's a thief in the night, he comes unexpectedly. And it's this hour, this generation we're living in. The Bible talks about that we should not all sleep. But if I stay back in the revelations of Brother Branham, I've been going to sleep concerning the events of his coming and everything that it entails with it. And also the day of the Brother Jackson, it's all that I know that there's a miracle war, a building of a temple, and the Ezekiel war, and yes, there's half hour silence, but I know nothing more that I'm still stuck in that second watch. It is not a popular message, but I believe the bride of Jesus Christ that has the Holy Ghost, that's been leaning on the Holy Ghost rather than men, are seeing this picture. And what I see from what's going on, God's raising up a new crop. Those that do not want to move on, God will just leave them where they're at, just like he did to the, brother, the, the followers of Brother Branham. Well, they say, we're brother, the followers of Brother Branham say, well, we, we have the picture. We know what's going on. Do you? No, they don't. They know of some things, granted, and God gave them that one. He had that prophet on the scene. But the hour that we're living in now, God has moved on further than those days. In the days of Brother Jackson, but now he's gone into what's called the third watch. And if we're not found in that third watch, then I said to say, you're going to be found sleeping or caught unaware of what God's doing. Because as God has been opening up a lot of things in the last while, concerning things about his coming and the events involved in it, there's been more details. God, it's God's grace that has given it. It's not some intelligence that's trying to figure these things out. There's certain things that, that has to be revealed in its time because the season and the time warrants for certain scripture come to the forefront. 
just like in the days of Brother Branham, it had to come to the forefront that God had to use an, a prophet to speak about six seals. <coughs> so, praise the Lord. Now, what I was looking at, <coughs> maybe somebody can get a glass of water. Yeah. It's on the way? Okay, praise the Lord. Even preachers are not immune to being sick, so. <laughs> but praise the Lord. I'm looking at Revelation chapter 1, starting at the 12th verse in your Bible. For you that don't have Bibles, there it is. I'm making it maybe too easy for you. New chairs, don't, you can look on the screen. No, it's not, it's so that we can see the same thing. So praise the Lord. Now I'm going to read it from verse 12 down to verse 15 or 16. And then we're going to look at some things this morning. It says, I turned to see the voice that spake unto me. Being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Okay, so you see seven golden candlesticks. <coughs> and in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, now these candlesticks, if you're new, it represents the seven church ages of time. From the time... <coughs> these seven church ages did not start in 33 A.D., but it started around 53, speaking about Gentile church age, not grace age. What's the difference between the grace age and the church age? The grace age starts at 33 AD, while the, the sorry, the grace age starts at 33 AD, and the church ages starts at around 53 to 56 AD. But both, as far as the scripture is concerned, they end at the same time. So therefore, the seven church ages are in the grace age. So we see here Jesus, he's in amongst the seven candlesticks, which when we're reading from verse 12 to verse 16, it shows you a complete picture. It's a summary of this grace age. But there are some particular things, and I, some things was brought a long time ago, certain aspects, but we're going to look at something, I don't know if you remember it or, or, or had been involved in un hearing the messages way back in the 60s. It says, and then he says here, in the midst of the seven candlestick, one like unto the Son of Man. He didn't say he was the Son of Man. One like unto him. What's really transpiring? Well, John was picked up from 96 AD. His body stayed there. But in a vision, he was brought to this hour, or the end time. And as he's brought to the end time, now he sees one like unto the Son of Man. Now remember, he's looking at this not at the literal Lord Jesus that might be there. It's a vision. A vision is something that portrays the real person, but it's just a vision. Okay, so who's, who's projecting that? Is the angel projecting that image to the Apostle John, showing him a summary of the Gentile church age? Is that clear enough? Okay, good. So, like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded about the paths with a golden girdle. Now, the pat, how many of you know what the word pats means? It's the shoulder or the breast area. Okay, so he's shown up here, having been girded. Now, that represents something important when we're looking at the picture, because it'll help explain some things when we're talking about this is a summary. So, he had a 
about him, the girdit, girdit means tied around the path with a golden girdle, or, and his head was, as it were, white as wool, like wool, and as white as snow, and his eyes was a flame of fire. And his feet was like unto fine brass, as it burns into a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. These are all, in these few verses, are all typing something in reality. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and those stars belong, one star belonged to each candlestick. But he had them in his hands. In other words, showing he had them in his hand, he had control. He was the one leading, if you want to. These are the messengers to each church age that's from 53 AD to the very end. All right. And he had his in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And we know that the sharp two-edged sword is none other but the word of God itself. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in its strength. Now, when we're looking at this picture, there's been different pictures, really, that's portrayed. It's just a man's rendition. And those that paint pictures that you catch on images on Google, on the Internet, are only up to where their understanding is at. So not everybody that puts an image on there is accurate in how it's his description. But as John sees this, he sees Jesus. He he doesn't say in the book of Revelation whether verse 12 to verse 15, it doesn't or 16, it doesn't say that he's standing or sitting here. It just said he's in the midst of those candlesticks. And while he's in the midst of those candlesticks, which portrays to us a summary of time, but the reason it shows I believe it shows the summary at the end of the completion of the seven church ages. This is what this picture is about. Now Jesus today and since 33 AD has been sitting on on the throne being our mediator and high priest. And some things I just learned lately. You only learn about it if you come across it. Now There's another picture I guess I should bring up. Here's a type of the high priest of the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the dressing or the garb of a high priest, he is not girded about the paps. He is girded about the waist. So in the picture John seen in the book of Revelation, had it been Jesus in his priestly office, still in his priestly office, it would have had the girdle about his waist as being a priest. But it is about his shoulders or the breast area, which a judge, that's where he wears a girdle, girdle, golden girdle about him to show that he is in a judge position. So when John's looking at this picture, he looks at it in his finished summary. He shows them as being judged. And at the end of this church age, when the seventh seal is broke, he will be judged. And he'll be judged where? At the wedding supper? No. Is he judged before the seventh seal is broke? As far as girded about the past? Yes, he judged our sins on Calvary, and we're being judged in that manner there. But to sit as a judge, being girded about, that means a judge in a judgely function, and he's no longer the high priest. Although he's been high priest for almost 2,000 years. Is that clear enough? All right. Now... When it talks about, and I'm, you that been on a little, been on in years, that been through the message for a while, 
when it talks about, in verse 14, that his head was as, and his hair was as white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as like a flame of fire. Now, Jesus didn't have gray hair when he died. And when we meet him in the air, he won't have gray hair either. Because he does, I'm sorry to announce you this bad news, but you'll have gray hair too. All right? This is all symbolizing why is he with gray hair? Is it because it has nothing to do with age? First of all, when we talk about God, the great eternal spirit, he don't grow old and he don't have one gray hair. But gray hair signifies maturity and wisdom in this picture. So now he has wisdom and maturity. He's there as judge because the pap, he's girded about the pap rather than the waist. It shows the Gentile, grace, the Gentile church age has come to a complete, he's in a complete picture as you see it here. Now his feet was like fine brass. The brass in the Bible, remember how Moses put up the brazen or the brass serpent? Whoever looked upon him would live. Well, Jesus passed God's judgment. So it shows him in his, that he, he did judge our sins. He's there as our high priest and advocate. But one day we will stand before that judge that's going to judge us what we've done here on the earth. There's many scriptures that talks about that particular area. Now, as we look, while he's on the mercy seat, he's there, girded about the waist. How many can appreciate that picture? Details makes, makes importance in understanding what you're looking at. Because we could be reading that first chapter. Oh, that's when in the beginning uh, he's just showing how things are going to progress. It shows it in its final aspect. All right. So since Jesus is still high priest, he has not put on the, gir the golden girdle about his paps. But when we reach that half hour of silence, that's where he will. Because you're still in part... Uh, if you want to, like the overlapping of the Gentile church age. You're in the, the final closing days of it. Although the seventh seal is broke, we're still here on the earth. And when he comes and he becomes judge, not to judge our salvation, but to judge the reward, what did we do with God's word? And I have to say to this generation, and even this movement, what are you doing with God's word today? Because whatever word God brings on ground, he's going to judge us about it. He's not going to judge those of the second watch only with the requirements of the second watch. Because the time has moved in. Those that were in that hour has now moved into this hour. And they'll be required, what have you done in that third watch? Well, I preached salvation and I preached uh, about the miracle war and so forth. That's fine. But what did you do with my word in the third watch when I brought the words in that hour? I wouldn't want to be standing before him in judgment then. Because the reality is, either what's being brought forth, it is his word, or it's a false revelation. Both can't be right. Somebody's going to be wrong. And I believe we're right. Because it fits in the picture ever so beautifully, the things we've been looking at. Now when he's, like I mentioned earlier here, just in the message, when he becomes judge, he does not, he is not judge at the wedding supper to judge our rewards. The bride's not going to be judged. He's not going to judge his wife. And he can't judge in 
the Gentile church age because not everybody is in it. Otherwise, he would say, well, as they come up, I'm going to judge them. He has reserved a day, a time to do it in. So the only place that you can fit that judgment time is within that half hour silence. Praise the Lord. And if you want to turn for just a moment to the scripture we've been last week, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Like I mentioned before, we, this verse has been read, but I haven't seen any that had put it in, it in its real context of what we see here this morning. Because you couldn't see the full effect of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, till you saw the time that the seasons be, the uh, centuries were over, till the time we get to the place where the three watches are in place. All that plays in a part in order to bring the beauty of this scripture into place. Because without it, you don't know where to put that judgment seat of Christ. If someone has that revelation and knowledge, put it forth. And if it's God's word, it'll fit with everything else. But it's time for that verse to come to the forefront and to be on ground is in 2017, the time we're living now. So I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead. Now the quick. Well, we can, we can, someone can say, well, that's when Jesus, when God quickens someone. It's more than quickening someone. The quick is, re, is in, implying that someone that's been made alive while in this mortal body here on earth. Because those in heaven are not called being quicked. Only the living element that's on live, on ground, that you can call the quick. Is that clear enough? All right. So he says, he is the judge of the quick and the dead. So he's showing two categories that he's going to be judging. And like I mentioned before, it can't be in the, in the grace age or the Gentile church age because the whole... Numbers has not been completed. But now he sits in that half hour silence. He's really occupied to the fullest to deal with all those bride saints that has died before us, that are bride saints. Because this judgment that we're talking about here, the judgment seat of Christ, in this instance, is pertaining only to the bride has nothing to do with white robes, sheep or goats or anything. It speaks about the bride only. So while he's judging those bride saints for their reward on an individual basis, now I'm going to quote a number, but I'm not, I'm not saying it's that in heaven. Let's say there's 10 million brides up there that have been died since the grace age started. If he's doing it on an individual basis... And Jesus is not going to split himself to a thousand pieces. God's everywhere present, nowhere absent, but he's not. So if we have to appear before him, that means individual basis. And if he has to give him a little bit of time to each one, in the rough it would take about three to three and a half years. Now some say, well, it can't be three and a half or three. I'm not here to dispute the number of length of time, but I'm all here to tell you it's not two weeks, or ten years. It fits within that half-hour silence. Because that half-hour silence tells me when the angel comes down, as Christ is, is being projected, and that angel is projecting Christ as if he was here himself, that when he sounds his voice, there's a message in that to begin with. The seven thunders other their voices. Those two things has to roll through the bride... And that's not done in two weeks. And it's not because we heard it the first time we get everything. How many here, when God brings a new revelation, you get it the first time you heard it? No, it takes a bit to, to go through. So there's a bit of time while 
We are receiving the thunders. And the other end of the half hour silence is when the bride, whoever God chooses to prophesy to the tongues and nations and so forth, you don't do the, the Christian or whatever world that God's having these to go to, whether it's nation, people, and tongues, you don't do that in two weeks either. Unless he anoints every member of the bride and each one is, you scatter out now and we'll have this done. So that too will take year, year and a half, or whatever time it's going to take. So it's there indirectly looking at real time. You're looking anywhere from two, three, three and a half years. But in the meantime, we must stand, when we're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he says he's going to judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. Now, we can get the idea, oh, he has to appear, and then, then that's when the judgment takes place. He has appeared in angelic form to you and I here. He's not appearing to the saints that are in heaven. He's there. That's the literal Lord Jesus. But he is appearing in the form that angel is presenting Christ, and he's got every instruction to you and I, and it's not just for a certain selected area or group or place, because it's going to be worldwide. He has one foot on the land and one foot on the sea, and we're going to receive our judgment down here on the earth, the quick, in that half-hour silence. That's the only place where you can put this. I haven't heard a peep where it could be, whether it's out here somewhere or at the wedding supper. Why can't they put it? Because it's, if they can't put it, because they haven't been following the revelation of this hour. It's so easy to say, no, it can't be that. That just tells me somebody don't know. Why can you say it can't be that if you don't know, if you can't present what it is? Shame on you. So now, again, I'm, I know I've been over this for a while, but it's, I just can't get, get away from it. When we look, she Luke chapter 19, verse 15. In Revelation chapter 5 and 12, before when Jesus breaks that seal in heaven, it's in heaven in verse 12, where those that are in glory says, you are worthy to receive honor, power, and, and glory for the millennium reign to come. He's given that authority, he's given that investment. He's not entered into it yet, but now he's officially told of it. He's officially told of it because his priestly function has finished. Now he's been instructed of his new function that he's going to have in the millennium. That is taking place right not far after that seventh seal is broke. Now having received the authority, now that's where Luke as the Lord gave Luke to record, Luke chapter 19 is when he has come down here after receiving the authority for the kingdom. That was after the seal was broke. Now he's down here. And Luke doesn't say he came down and he went up and then, then the judgment takes place. He's down here and he calls his servants and he's given them, he's there before his judgment seat. Because when he talks about the how that the good servant that was given one, one pound and he increased by ten, and he says, because you've done that, you will get rain over ten cities. That's the reward part. He's not questioning the servants. Are you saved? No. He's questioning, what have you done with my word? And if at that time that servant should increase tenfold, now there's another servant, he increases from one to five. The average is about seven to one. That's why there's sevenfold light in this hour that we live in. If you're not walking in this third watch, I'd have to say you have not come to the completion or to the full area of the sevenfold light. Not sevenfold salvation over the Holy Ghost, but sevenfold light of understanding of the plan of God. So we've seen how Luke puts it there. Now when we look at Again, in 2 Timothy, 
chapter 1. Uh, verse 4, sorry. Second, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. He's going to judge the quick and the dead. These are happening at the same time. One in heaven by the Lord, the literal Lord Jesus Christ, and the other one is done through that angelic being that's protecting Christ here to you and I on the earth. And it says here, and the dead at his appearing. What appearing are we looking at? At his appearing, it is speaking in the term of a completed function that he's done to judge the quick and the dead. Because by the time that angelic being is judging the living bride, the quick on the earth, and Jesus is doing those in heaven, then when he does appear, he don't have to wait long because it's at his appearing that it is completed. He's not going to appear and then he's going to judge the quick and the dead. It is done prior, just prior to him coming to meet us. And his appearing is not in heaven. His appearing to you and I, where is it? In the air. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And we are alive, are changed in a what? In ten years? Maybe five. Maybe three. No, in a twinkling of an eye. So the judgment can't be at the time we meet him in the air in the terms of when the rapture is actually taking place. That's the trumpet. That's not the judgment. But all has been done once that angel on the earth that deals with us prior because after that seventh seal is broke and he's dealing with the saints in heaven, everything is ready so they can come and meet in the air, those in heaven, they have to come in the air as well. Why do they have to come in the air? They're up in glory. They don't have a resurrected body. And they have to come through the earth when the trump is actually sounded. Because he's going to sound that trump. And all those bright saints in heaven are coming earthwise to pick up their resurrected body. The dead in Christ rise first. Let's put it this way. Are they in heaven, rising in heaven? Rising means something that's down below. You have to rise up to it. Right? So he's, he's dealing with, at the, when that, he sounds that trump, that last trump, they come up and they're in the air. While he's dealing with them to come up in the air, because the judgment now is over concerning the, the deceased bride saints, and the judgment is over concerning the quick of the live bride that's on the earth. Because then we're going to be changing the twinkle of an eye. He's not going to sit around, well, I know you fellas in heaven there. You came and you got your resurrected body and just by that trump and that, everything was done. Yes, that will be done in a moment. He's not going to sit around, well, I'm waiting for them now. There's some stragglers until they finally get in the right place so I can judge them right. No. The bride will have been ready. So at his appearing... That's where that takes place. So, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, part A. At his appearing, that's right here. So everything was prepared during that half hour. So when he does appear, it is completed. Because once he appears and we go to be with him, immediately we go to the wedding supper. The wedding supper is not the judgment seat of Christ. Well, praise the Lord. I, I, it's a wonderful picture, isn't it? There's more yet. A few more details I want to bring in there. Now, part B of that same verse, it says, at his appearing and his kingdom. Now, Minds can go to works at his kingdom. Oh, I remember in Matthew chapter 13, verse 40 or 41, that he'll remove everything that offends and commits iniquity out of his kingdom. That's the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom which he's in. Well, that would be removing things that would be progressive over time all down through anyway. 
But when it talks about his kingdom, a ruling in the millennium, that's where this verse, his kingdom is pointing to the millennium kingdom. If you have some Bible that can translate or different translation, it renders that as being the millennium. It's not pointing to uh, Matthew chapter 13 where he's going to remove everything that offends out of his kingdom. Now, just there, when you're looking at it, it if you th- stop and read for a moment, just slowly, he's removing things that offend out of his kingdom. At the judgment seat of Christ, is he removing people out of, the, out, out of his kingdom? No. They're getting different rewards. None is being removed out of his kingdom, if you want to look at it in that manner. So that, Matthew chapter 13, verse 41, cannot be applied to Second Th- Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Just thought I'd bring that up, because if you haven't looked at it, because when you look at that Matthew chapter 13, he's there, and over time, he's going he's to be removing things at the end time, and that's been since the day of the brother Branham. Things that offend and things that commit iniquity. What commits offend and iniquity? It's concerning, pointing to what are they doing with the word of God. It's not someone that went to a beer joint. Yes, that shouldn't be among Christians too. But he's talking about things that offends. It's offensive to him when he brings a word and somebody puts it in a different light. Commits iniquity, saying, what God's brought, no, that's not right. See that you refuse not him that speaketh from heaven in this hour. He just did, he didn't start speaking from heaven in the days of Brother Branham. And he didn't stop speaking from heaven in the days of Brother Jackson. There's this third watch. And that hangs over even in this watch. If we refuse to him that speaking from heaven. And if you've been leaning on flesh and just your intelligence to see what truth is, that's why you're in a problem. But if you've been leaning on the Holy Ghost, it's something... When, you, when the Lord came to bring you to salvation... It's not because you figured it out. Something transpired inside. Something something says, that's real. That's right. And so is it here at the end time. When the truth that comes in this third watch, that same Holy Ghost will confirm the same thing as he done when he brought you to him in salvation. But if we have neglected that and been leaning on our own flesh... Well, I've I got to see what brother and so-so says about this. What are the other brothers saying about this? Uh, do you think uh, we have it? That shows me someone is not leaning on the Holy Ghost. They're leaning on flesh, intelligence. And this is an hour where a man will not get away with it. Not in this third watch, because to be in that half-hour silence, to be before the judgment seat of Christ... You, have, you will have to need to know when he is coming because he said, watch, pray, and watch. He didn't say get lazy, just preach the first watch. Just preach the second watch. Everybody's going to make it. No, everybody's not going to make it. Because then he will come a thief unto you because you won't know what's transpiring in this period of time. Can you see the picture? All right. Now, I want to go, uh, before I I go to the the next portion, I just want to go over a little bit here. In Revelation chapter 1, He's seen his feet was as brass. Judgment. Is that concerning the judgment seat of Christ? No. It's concerning how he took, he was, he judged, he was judged for our sins. But now when we go to Revelation chapter 10, if you want to turn to it. Am 
I'm going to read it there. Now, Revelation chapter 10 occurs after Jesus has broke the seal. That's in Revelation, excuse me, in Revelation chapter 8. Because after Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, you are now time-wise into that 10th chapter. It's not like reading a history book or a mathematic book that you, it's page after page just follows along. God purposely put things in a certain order so that the Holy Ghost can reveal how things are unfolding as revelatory picture is. Now in chapter 10, I saw a mighty angel come down. Now this mighty angel, if you look at Thessalonians, it says it's an archangel. Uh, the voice of the archangel is not, is it's, it's the same, isn't it? It is. And I saw a mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow about his head. Now there too, here he's coming. He's invest, this angel is invested with the characteristics of Christ, and the rainbow is the covenant, and it's the presence and the glory of God Almighty himself. This is going to be an hour that man has not has probably seen the anointing touch them till the days of, maybe of days of Brother Branham or the days of Moses and so forth. This will be something really, and it's not going to be for the whole world, it's going to be for the bride itself. And upon his head was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Why is his feet not brass, saying it's brass? It gives as if it was pillars or columns of fire. What is fire for? Now hold that scripture in mind. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll start at the 10th verse. Here's the Apostle Paul. He's talking about mainly the ministry, but it also applies to individuals as well in, in a certain type of it. He says, according to the grace of God which is given to me. So Paul didn't get out of his own. It's God's grace that's giving him this revelation and this understanding. I have laid the foundation, and another builds thereupon. Every servant is not to build just the foundation, but they're built upon the foundation. And yes, that's the early church. But in this hour, let every man build thereupon. Brother Branham, build upon more than what the Apostle Paul did. But if I'm just preaching Brother Brian's message, I'm not building upon. I'm just building, I'm just building his platform. The same goes for Brother Jackson. He built upon further than what Brother Branham did. And so a good servant will build upon what's been established. What about this hour? Huh? Right. All right, now it, we're going to go on. I have laid the foundation, and another builds there upon. But let every man take heed how he builds there upon. Why does it have to take heed? Because Satan can come into the picture and try to give a false slant on a revelation. It's not like, well... I can read something, maybe I'll try to figure things out. Oh, here's a good picture, I'll just present this. It don't come that way. If, if we're building upon in the same manner that Paul built upon, God, by his grace, gave it to him. That's number one. So every servant is whatever God gives to them to build upon. But if I use my own intelligence to build upon, I am not building upon.
Now, if any man builds upon these foundations, uh, upon this foundation. Now, every servant, whether it is in the beginning of the grace age or even now, that servant must build upon or have a knowledge of the basic foundation first and build upon the foundation God's already established. But then if he's moving in his hour, then it's to build upon it, not build with it. You build with it, but there comes a place where God wants to move forward, so therefore to move forward, you have to build upon. All right. Now, if any man builds upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, now, he's using those elements. He's talking about the ministry, yes, basically. But if they're building, depends on how they're building upon it. If they're building on something that's precious, uh, divine revelation coming down, that is precious. But if I'm building upon a human thought, that's wood, hay, and stubble. And every man work shall be made manifested, for the day shall declare it. What day is he talking about? He's talking about right here. Yes, one can be in a ministry, and if he's not careful, Things can happen in that hour, and it'll judge him, and his ministry will fall apart. Well, when he talks about that day, he's talking about the reward part. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is, ta- is going to be pointing to you and I what's going to happen to rewards, not salvation. And every man's work shall be made manifested, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. That angel that's there in Revelation chapter 10, his feet is as if it was columns or flames of fire. What's, the, what's that representing? It's on his feet, his feet's touching the earth, and it's coming to burn, or to test the, if you want to, at the judgment seat of Christ. What if our work's going to burn or not? Some things are going to burn. Not everybody's getting silver or ten cities. Some will lose some of their rewards. Now, I'm not going to speak about the case where the man that loses all his reward. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, where the man, he was, a, he was a believer, he was in the church, but he had his father's wife, and he was told to put him out of his church. He says he'd be saved by, by fire, but just his life, he has no reward. Because his life, his natural life, he couldn't, overcome certain things. But I'm mainly looking concerning how we're building upon in this hour. The fire, it shall be revealed by fire and shall try every man's work. Now when it says every man's work, that's over here. That angel comes down with, now it's like it says pictures. I wish they would be more accurate in doing the pictures. Uh, I can only grab, and I'm, I'm not an artist, so. But his feet was as flame of fire. That's symbolizing he's coming to burn things that don't belong there. That's here. That's in reference to you and I down here, because he's talking about the living. And if any man's work shall burn, he shall suffer loss. Loss of what? But he himself shall be saved, yet as by fire. Now remember in Revelation chapter 1, feet of brass, not feet of flaming fire. But in Revelation chapter 10, because it applies only to this period, to this point in time in that half hour silence, it is flames of fire showing, and his eyes is also going to be a flame of fire. He's going to burn right, I'll put it, don't, I mean to put it this way, it'll burn right straight through you because there's nothing we can say. Because the Spirit of Almighty God knows every intent and thought 
we will not have an excuse. We're going to say, well, look, you, Lord, you didn't know how, the, how hard it was. And, and, that, and that's why. There ain't good. First of all, when that present comes, because of the amber glow that the angel is going to project, project on the earth, God's there too involved. And like Brother Branham had that experience, I, I still go back to it. He says, as if it sees right through you and you have no excuse. And as that angel comes in that form, when I looked at in, um, in Daniel chapter 10, verse 5 and 6, don't have to turn to it, I'm just going to mention it. There you see Gabriel, it says, I'll read the, I'll read the verse for you. Then I lifted up my eyes in Daniel chapter 10, verse 5 to 6, well, maybe I could put it up for you. It could be, make it easier for you again, I suppose. <coughs> I lifted up my eyes, and behold, a certain man clothed in fine linen, and about his loins were girded, with fine gold. Now here Daniel says he's girded about the loins. Here. In Daniel is showing what Christ would be in his high priestly office. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 to 13, shows him girded about the path, which is different. Not that it makes a different picture. It's just what is, the angel is, is portraying or projecting to Daniel, and his body was like beryl, and his face was as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as a lamp of fire, and his arm and his feet were in the color of polished brass. That would be Jesus during, it's a type of Christ and what he would be there in, in that time. And the voice, his voice was like the voice of many waters. Now, here's Daniel, he's seen this, this his face was as bright as lightning or as the sun, if you want to. Now, if it affected Daniel this way, and Daniel alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quake fell on them so that they fled and hid themselves. And therefore I was alone and saw the great vision, and there remained no strength in me, it affected him such. Now, if that vision given to Daniel affected him, Daniel, that he had no strength in him, that angel in Revelation chapter 10 comes in the same manner. He's also as bright as the sun shines. Don't you think we might feel a little faint ourselves? Huh? That's going to be quite an experience. But we can rest assured when he comes in a half hour of silence and you're there before him, he's not judging you whether you're going to heaven or hell. He's going to be judging your reward. Yes, we'll shake, but not because you're losing your salvation. There remains no strength where my company was turned into corruption and I retain no strength. Okay? The same with Brother Branham on that mountain when the angels appeared to him. He fell as dead. He thought, sure. I, I'm just trying to portray when that vision appears, how it's going to affect. We think, oh, oh there's an angel appear. It's just like watching a movie. Praise the Lord, that was nice. It's going to be more than that. In... In, yes, in Revelation chapter 1, so he is also shining in that manner. But what I'm trying to portray here, when the Lord does come in the form of an, as that angel projects Christ to us, look what happened to the disciples when on Mount Transfiguration, when he was transfigured before them. Now, they might have been scared for a moment, but then they wanted to build a temple and stay there. Uh, 
us mortal human creature, we get nervous when, when, when there's an unknown, right? Oh, we're going to stand before him. Oh, Lord, I love you. But what are you going to do when we stand in that half hour silence? We will still love him because we'll have that assurance, that knowledge. Because if you stand before his judgment seat, you have made it. Maybe your rewards didn't, but you and I have made it. So we can rest in that knowledge. If we didn't have that knowledge, our knees would rattle so bad that the... Well, you know what I mean. So there you go. Praise the Lord. So when he talks about here is his appearance, because we're more concerned now with this time frame here. And I'm thankful that in describing the angel in Revelation chapter 10, one foot on land and one foot on the sea, it's universal. As I know somewhere where we're, well, that, do we have to be somewhere? Does it have to be in Indiana where Brother Brown and Brother Jackson was? Do we have to go there? I know back in the days of Brother Branham, some thought it was the rapture and those things were taking place in one place and they were going to try to get everybody in one place. And they're still doing that today. They're actually buying a big piece of land somewhere where all the bride can come in a certain time when somebody gives the announcement. Now that's where they're going to meet the Lord and they're going to go up in the rapture. That's not even close to the picture. They have fallen asleep concerning that half-hour silence. They're in that first watch. What's happening to the second watch? And if God permits in this third watch that God gives yet some more information of what's maybe up ahead, do you know what's up ahead? No, I don't. Till He reveals it, till it fits the scripture, you just have to be silent about it. But when He does open it up, it'll fit with everything else. What a privileged people we are. I was going to play a short video. I might do it next Sunday. Ten minute sermon, a uh, video. I know sometime when, every time I minister, forsake not the assembling yourself, bang. Next thing you know, there's less. Brother Jackson in the seals, number 14, around the 37-minute mark. Here is a man of that stature that the Lord had raised up. And he's saying the same things. Why do you just come Sunday in the morning and not Sunday evening? So you can watch it on the Internet. Take your ease. Then he says, well... If it's good for you, then why can't I at home do a pre-recorded sermon or just preach from home and send it out in the air? And I can sit on the couch and have my feet up in the air. What's the purpose? Well, I don't know. There's certain services. That, uh, it's, well, you know, I have more fun at home. God didn't ask you to have fun. What are sacrifice? I'll play the video next Sunday. But if you want to see it ahead of time, it's seal number, number 14 on the video. At the 37 mark, listen to it. Now, if they could do that to the, an apostle of that stature, of that hour of the truth that he was bringing, What was happening? People was getting cold. Lord, I want to serve you on Sunday mornings. Now he says, well, I'll just finish off some things, I guess. He says, if you're sick or something happens in the family, he says, I have no qualms about those things. 
But if have, if any, if you can go to the grocery store, or convenience store, get something for your supper instead of coming to the church. What? Because he talks about the generation of his hour. They were there through thick and thin. It's wonderful when God feeds us. And God loves to feed us. But there's time. He's looking at us. Okay, let's see what happens. Do they really love me when I might not give something new? Or the spirit won't move like, like, it, like it, sometimes it does. And he's looking at, do you still love me? Oh, yes, we love you, Lord. Really? I don't mean that to bring reproach. Well, yes, in one way. I mean, don't you want to, aren't we going to live with him? How are we going to learn to work together? How are we going to learn to carry the burden with one another? Because if you're sitting at home, I can't shake your hand, I can't hear a testimony from you, and so forth. Well, I don't do nothing. I just, uh, the, just your presence of the Holy Spirit in the assembly makes a difference. Now, I've said that, there's going to be less sun next Sunday. I guess it's just the way it is. It doesn't have to be that way. It shows who's genuine, sincere, and who's not. Ouch. I know. But sometimes you have to say the hard things. I don't mean that to put finger on anyone. Aren't we all part of that body? Are we not... We're not just growing by revelation what we hear from the pulpit. There's that interaction of the believers among themselves. Well, that's going into another message. I better stop here. Cause if I didn't care, I'd say, hey, maybe if you're not too interested, maybe we'll just have the one service in the week. And if, if that's too much of you, maybe every second week, you know. You know, how, how, how's that, how would you like that? Let's have a vote. Lord, is it okay we take a vote on this? We know what his word says. All right, let's just stand. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would kindle the fire, Lord. Make us really realize with the importance of what you're molding, not just uh, in revelatory, but also concerning our nature. I just pray, Lord, that you'd minister to the brothers and sisters that you would see fit. I commit this in your hands, in a wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated. We'll play one and someone has a need. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's a good message. We get what we put in it. That's how it works. If you can't make the time. But for the blood shed on
but for the blood shed on Calvary Street. But for the blood, it'd be no hope for you and me. For all my righteousness is filthy rags, and that's all I'd ever be. But to wish a happy birthday to a birthday girl in here. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Maxine. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Max. <laughs> Everybody's happy. We'll turn the service. Uh, Brother Fred, dismiss. It could have been worse. I could have maybe stayed so long that have your dinner burned. I don't know. But praise the Lord. Now, somewhere we have to look at what are we doing with our lives because we're going to have to give an account. Praise the Lord. Let's just stand this time. Now, I know I sometimes tease the brother or call him the rabbi, so I'm going to ask Marco to dismiss us in a word of prayer. So. Lord bless each one.